While efforts are still ongoing to address some of the issues raised on police brutality in the recent NSARS protests, the nation's number three citizen, and that's talking about the Senate President Ahmed Lawan, is warning that the nation may face another citizen's restiveness similar to the NSARS protests if it fails to effectively address the problem of youth unemployment. Senator Lawan gave the warning today during the budget defense session of the Ministry of Agriculture at the National Assembly. And one way he believes the government can address youth unemployment is through agriculture. Our correspondent Linda Akigwe reports. And charity to one another. The 2021 budget defense exercise in the National Assembly enters the third week. More heads of government agencies are opening up their 2021 budget proposals for scrutiny before relevant committees. The Senate President attends the budget defense session of the Ministry of Agriculture and he warns the federal government of the dangers of not learning lessons from the NSAS protest. Recently, we had some of our youth protesting. Some of them very genuinely, they were seeking the attention of leaders and they got the attention of leaders. So our budget, especially for 2021, should be mindful of what we do to provide employment opportunities for this youth. And for us elected people, we are going to be accountable. If we escape this one, the other one is inescapable. While the Senate President wants government to learn lessons from the NSAS protest, the Attorney General of the Federation, Mr. Bubaka Malami, refuses to answer questions from journalists on the freezing of bank accounts owned by NSAS protesters. The Central Bank of Nigeria received an ex parte order granted by Justice Ahmed Mohammed to freeze the accounts of 20 individuals and an organization linked to the NSAS campaign. However, speaking in an interview with journalists on the sidelines of a budget defense session, the chairman, Senate Committee on Judiciary, tells journalists that the committee is yet to get details of the matter. It came to us as news, and uh, we're also interested in knowing uh, what uh, actually is going on in this regard, and uh, if it is true, what, uh, I mean, the stakeholders in charge are trying to achieve with it. But as a committee, we're interested in, in knowing what's going on in that regard. Senator Bamidele also says the committee will look into the report that six Nigerians have been jailed in the United Arab Emirates for funding Boko Haram. This is as the Solicitor General of the Federation, Mr. Dayo Akwata, told the Judiciary Committee earlier that the federal government plans to spend two billion naira on legal services to include prosecution and trial of Boko Haram members. Linda Akibi, Channels Television News. And the issue of the NSARS protests also formed part of the discussion when the president received the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Amina Mohammed, in his office today. The president says it's important for the youth to keep the peace as it will be in their own interest to do so. On her part, the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations is calling for better youth and government engagement in handling such crises. Our correspondent Kayla Megua reports. This visit to the State House in Abuja by the United Nations Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed is one in a series of visits to some African countries to discuss strategies to rebuild setbacks caused by the COVID 19 pandemic. The closed door meeting lasted over three hours, and according to a statement by a presidential spokesman, the recent NSARS protest and its aftermath were discussed. It was unfortunate, and we believe that um, in addressing uh, the demands that were made by the young people, perhaps this is a lesson that we can take into the future on how um, we engage on such issues. Um, it is, uh, I have to say that, you know, there are many protests around this world that have been exacerbated by COVID because COVID has left people out of work, it's left people hopeless um, because of the socioeconomic impacts. And in many of those protests, we have not seen governments turn around and respond as quickly as this government did. Uh, so the UN's, you know, the UN's response to this is that 
we must make sure that what happened in these protests is um, uh, we are able to address those issues, those gaps, um, and to begin the reform. In fact, I would say the transformations that are needed uh, to address many of these outstanding issues. And for that, we need an engaged youth and we need an engaged government. Next, the UN Deputy Secretary General pays a visit to the Vice President, Professor Yemiu Shimbajo. And there, she flags out the Nigeria UN Plus offer for socioeconomic recovery 2020 2022, which is aimed at supporting Nigeria in its immediate efforts at risk mitigation. This offer by the United Nations will mobilize for Nigeria $250 million. This is very helpful to us because um, we put together a plan that costs, uh, that will cost us $2.3 trillion. Uh, half of that, as I pointed out earlier, is in the form of loans and facilities. Uh, the other half of it, of course, is uh, budgeted funds. But we still have, have a huge gap. You know, and uh, that, that gap, I think, has been very well made up for by uh, this initiative. Mrs. Mohammed leads a team of senior UN officials who will, over the next couple of days, visit Niger, Syria alone, and Ghana. Before leaving Nigeria, however, the team will conduct an assessment of the resettlement efforts in Borno State. From the State House in Abuja, Kayla Magua, Channels Television News. And in Taraba State, in the northeast, the State Judicial Panel of Inquiry and Restitution for Victims of Police Brutality has assured victims of adequate security protection, devoid of intimidation, before, during and after testifying before the panel. At the maiden sitting held in Jalingo, the chairman of the panel, retired Justice Christopher Awubra, promised to be fair to all parties, adding that so far the panel has received 11 petitions. According to him, the commission is a closed one where privacy will be given due consideration and only petitions on merit will get justice. We are standing on our integrity and we are saying, assuring you that your desire is to receive attention on your petitions and our desire is to give you justice. So we are expecting us to give you justice and we are promising to give justice if and only if your petition has made it, whether for or against, the commission has promised protection. And I told you here that this is a closed commission. I wanted I use that word. Closed in the sense that privacy is very important. Away from the aftermath of the NSAS protests, the federal government has approved the disposal of recovered stolen assets over the next six months. Speaking at the inauguration of the committee, the Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice, Mr. Wokalamalami, insists that the committee must be transparent in disposing the assets. He adds that the 2019 asset tracing, recovery, and management regulations shall serve as a guideline for the committee. I thank you most sincerely for attending. It is the inauguration of an interministerial committee on the disposal of Federal Government of Nigeria's forfeited assets. The Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice gives a marching order to the committee as he highlights their responsibilities. The committee has a time frame of six months for the disposal of all Federal Government forfeited assets. The responsibilities of the interministerial committee include to implement provisions of the Asset Tracing and Recovery Management Regulations, ensure the transparency of the disposal of federal government final forfeited assets, ensure synergy and collaboration with the, between the Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice and law enforcement and anti-corruption agencies, other relevant ministries, departments and agencies, and non-governmental organizations in the collation of records of all assets. He proceeds to inaugurate the 22-member committee headed by the Solicitor General of the Federation. Attending. 
for 2019 asset tracing, recovery and management regulations, as well as the standard operating procedures and terms of reference, are the working tools for the Interministerial Committee. The committee will be guided in the execution of its mandate by the Asset Tracing, Recovery and Management Regulation 2019, standard operating procedures, terms of reference, and other applicable extant regulations and legislations. Why the committee secretariat has developed a work plan to assist or guide the committee's members in the effective discharge of this duty, I wish to assure you all, the stakeholder, that the operations of the committee will be guided by the twin pillar of transparency and accountability. The inauguration of the committee with members drawn from relevant agencies that deal with recovery and disposal of recovered assets is aimed at ensuring proper coordination of the disposal of federal government assets and for promoting a uniform, harmonized and transparent procedure to safeguard the assets recovered by the relevant agencies in line with the anti-corruption drive of President Buhari's administration. Air Vice Marshal Ahmed Muazu retired as the new acting chairman of the Independent National Electoral Commission as Professor Mahmoud Yakubu bows out, af out of office after spending the statutory five-year term. Speaking at the handing over ceremony at the INEC headquarters in Abuja, the outgoing chairman notes that the choice of Air Vice Marshal Muazu retired to pilot the affairs of the commission pending the confirmation of his reappointment by the Senate is a consensus among the National Electoral Commissioners. In a brief ceremony at the headquarters of the Independent National Electoral Commission, the ongoing chairman, Professor Mahmoud Yakubu, hands over to retired Air Vice Marshal Ahmed Mwazu as the acting chairman of the commission. Thank you very much. Sworn into office on the 9th of November 2015, Professor Yakubu has completed his statutory five-year term and has to step aside as required by the law, even though he has been reappointed by President Muhammad Buhari for a second term. The commission is a constitutional body whose members are appointed for five years, which may be renewed for a second and final term. This means that my tenure and that of the first set of five commissioners ends today. Pending the conclusion of the statutory process, the remaining national commissioners have resolved that Air Vice Marshal Ahmed Muazu retired will oversee the affairs of the commission. It is therefore my pleasure to hand over to him in the interim. Professor Yakubu presided over the 2019 general election as well as several other off-season elections. While some of these elections were severely criticized by observer groups, the commission under his watch is also commended for conducting some credible elections. The recently concluded Edo and Undo governorship elections are reference points. Pending the confirmation of his reappointment by the Senate, the acting chairman of the commission promises to run the affairs of the commission with due diligence. I want to assure you all that I will handle the affairs, the routine affairs of the commission uh, with all due diligence. Before his appointment as the acting chairman, retired Air Vice Marshal Mazu was a national commissioner representing the Northeast and a member of the Electoral Operations and Logistics Committee of the commission. In part two, after the break, Petroleum and natural gas workers make good their threats to go on strike. Please stay with us. Welcome back. If you've just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 live on Channels Television, Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. A dire warning from the Senate President to the government. Pay serious attention to youth unemployment or brace up for more protests in the future. President Mohamed Buhari tells youth behind the NSAS protests it's in their interest to maintain peace as he receives the UN Deputy Secretary General. Petroleum and natural gas workers make good their threats to go on strike. 
and the cherry news from Pfizer and BioNTech as they announce a preliminary report showing that their vaccine can prevent 90% of people from getting COVID-19. And to our COVID-19 update, the governor of Niger State, Abubakar Bello, has tested positive for the virus. Governor Bello, who confirmed this on his Twitter handle, however, says he is asymptomatic and has gone into isolation. Niger State has seen a spike in the number of cases in one month, with a total of 278 confirmed cases. Meanwhile, the National Youth Service Corps has mobilized 66,000 Nigerian graduates from eligible institutions within and outside the country for the Batch B service year as camps reopen tomorrow, November 10th, after over seven months of inactivity because of the COVID-19 outbreak. The Director General of the NYSC, Brigadier General Shaib Ibrahim, stated this at a media conference in Abuja, noting that the prospective Corps members will be admitted into their respective camps only after undertaking a mandatory COVID-19 test. The Director General of the National Youth Service Corps, NYSC, arrives in the company of the Director General of the Nigeria Center for Disease Control for this media chat ahead of the reopening of the NYSC orientation camp on Tuesday, November the 10th. NYSC orientation camps were shot nationwide on March the 18th this year by the federal government as part of the measures to curtail the spread of COVID-19. Seven months after, the camps will now be reopened and 66,000 eligible graduates are expected to participate in a one-month orientation exercise amidst some strict safety protocols. As of Thursday, 5th November, a total of 66,000 eligible graduates have been mobilized for the 2020 Batch B service year. The measures which have been endorsed by the NCC during its expansion of camps include testing of prospective core members and course officials for COVID-19 by NCDC officials before admission into the orientation camps. Furthermore, the scheme has concluded arrangement with the National Health Insurance Scheme for the enrollment of core members into the NHI is in line with the presidential directive. The reopening of the camp is part of the federal government's gradual reopening of the economy. However, there should be cautious steps to avoid the occurrence of a second wave of the coronavirus. We need core members to hold each other accountable. So when they see another core member not wearing a mask, advise that core member that it is in our collective best interest for you to wear a mask. A second wave of infections is possible in Nigeria, but it is not inevitable. We can prevent it through our collective action and our collective responsibility. The news on the reopening of the orientation camps is no doubt a thing of joy for many eligible graduates who have been unable to carry out the mandatory one-year service to their fatherland because of the outbreak of COVID-19. This cherry news, however, comes with great responsibility as each core member is expected to take full responsibility and protect one another while the service year lasts. Meanwhile, President Mohamed Buhari has welcomed the arrival of the effective, the first one, coronavirus vaccine after a successful human trial phase. Reacting to the news that the vaccine has recorded 90% of effectiveness against the disease, the president described the development as a major milestone in medical advancement, but warned that the world must unite in facilitating the equitable access and distribution of these vaccines to protect people in all countries. President Mohamed Buhari reiterated his earlier call that only a people's vaccine with equality and solidarity at its core can protect all of humanity and get our society safely running again. A bold international agreement cannot wait. And away from COVID-19 related stories, the residents of Ashanti community in Ebutemeta area of Lagos have been counting their losses following a fire that gutted parts of the Okobaba community yesterday night. They say they are concerned that exactly a year ago the same incident happened and that the result was a 
take over of their land by some persons, a situation they believe is likely to happen again if they let down their guard. Our correspondent Gimba Umar reports. You at some point just stand there. Ruins of an area the size of two football fields sits black and charred. <laughs> Events of a day earlier, reminiscent of what happened here exactly a year ago. Anger still fills the heart of the youth, almost compromising our visit, but for the intervention of the community leader. The damage to what once was the home for the poor who worked the sawmills here burnt as a result of an explosion heard soon as electricity was restored. The evidence still visible. Smoke billows at different points. But not everything will be left to total ruins. The importance of Okobaba is undeniable. This sawmill is the largest sawmill in the Africa. This type of sawmill, we can just get this type of sawmill only in India. Formerly, around 1990, the Chinese are coming to this area and come and bought the a woods. If you, if you see China, that 1990 I'm talking about, you can see that they bring a, a big, big motor and buy a quality paco. But come see today, they just left this side as a side that they did not know that it's, a, it's, a, it's an uh, essential area. Million machines turned cackers. Shoe molds melted in a heap. Or the wooden food-making utensils miraculously saved, but not enough to stop the youth from pointing accusing fingers, saying among other things that they will resist any attempt to take over their land, in contrast from the now fenced piece of land they lost to developers. They use power, you understand? Are you sure it's the government that is doing this? It's not government, because I see some money is what is what is what let's say, those, um, those talk that are that are fighting to fighting for their land of peoples. For now, faces of women and children are long and depressed, suggestive of a need for assistance. This behind me is the reality. Children just trying to get whatever they can salvage from the burning that happened here last night. Will they succeed in getting back to winning ways and get their lives back? That's the big question. Gimba Umar, Channels Television News. To the health sector and security, the medical doctor who was kidnapped in Cross River State, Dr. Godwin Udo, has been released. This was confirmed by the Cross River State branch of the Nigeria Medical Association after an emergency general meeting. Dr. Udo regained his freedom on the 7th of November, although not unconditionally. The Cross River State NMA therefore say it will continue the indefinite withdrawal of medical services in the state despite Dr. Udo's release, until the security challenges affecting its members are adequately addressed. The association called on its members to comply with the directive while its state officers' committee continued to liaise with the state government on the issue. When the news at 10 returns, oil prices surged by more than 8% following the announcement of a potent vaccine for COVID-19 by Pfizer and BioNTech. Please join us again. Welcome back. To security in Zamfara State, bandits have attacked the convoy of the State Commissioner for Security and Home Affairs, Abubakar Dauran, killing his driver in the process. Confirming the incident, the State Police Command say Mr. Dauran's delegation was caught in a crossfire between two warring bandit groups jostling for supremacy at Dogon Karfi and Gidan Jaja along Zurumi Jibia Road in Zurumi local government area of Zamfara State. According to the police, the delegation was returning from Katsina State after handing over 26 women and children rescued by the Zamfara State government to the Katsina State government. In the northwestern region, Governor Nasu El Rufai of Kaduna State says his administration will next year enact a new law to strengthen and enhance the capacity of the traditional institutions by providing clearly defined roles for royal fathers. Governor El Rafai gave the assurance during the coronation and presentation of staff of office to the 19th Emir of Zazao 
Ambassador Nuhu Bamali in Zaria. The event was witnessed by the governors of Lagos and Plateau, the Sultan of Sokoto, and a host of other traditional rulers. The sound of drums and trumpets, plus the sight of men at arms, is not meant to cause panic. It's a celebration of the coronation ceremony of the 19th Emir of Zazal, and the roll call is impressive. Governors, top tradition rulers, and various communities have thronged Zaria to witness this day in Kaduna State. The arrival of the airman waiting is on horseback and is welcomed by a horde of supporters itching to take photos. Shortly after the opening prayers, the swearing in ceremony takes place, cementing the process. Governor Nasser El Rufai sets the challenge for the new Emir, which is to create an environment that will unite the country. These are more modern times with fresh opportunities and many old and new challenges. Ours is an incredibly young state, Your Highness, and so is Sasso Emirate, with 89% of residents being younger than 35 years of age. We are grappling with expanding the opportunities for jobs sound education and decent healthcare that can help channel this usefulness as a positive resource. A torch to the MSAs will be carried without forgetting the past. There is no better time to harness and promote the institution of traditional leadership as well as an area. Therefore, make a pledge to you today of our intention to continue the good words of our predecessors, most notably the late area. Other governors present agree that the time has come to bridge whatever gap there is with traditional rulers across the country. They are also the custodian of our tradition. They probably need to take a bit more deeper rule, you know, that, that currently obtains now. It would do even the government in taking care of issues about uh, security, of issues about uh, employment, of issues about confidence. As the new Emma takes the throne, many hope his reign will foster lasting peace. To the oil and gas sector, the Petroleum and Natural Gas Senior Staff Association of Nigeria, Pangasin, have declared a nationwide strike, sparking fears of fuel scarcity in the country. Pangasin President Festus Osifo confirmed the union's position during his appearance on Sunrise Daily today saying the action followed the expiration of a seven-day ultimatum given to the government. Mr. Osifo explained that the industrial action is due to the inability of the federal government to address the issues raised by the oil and gas workers. As of today, our members, members of Pengasan, we are, we are on strike. And another issue besides this IPs issue in that same letter that was released on the on, on November 22nd is also the issue of Baker Hughes. Uh, Baker Hughes uh, is a company, is a service company in the oil and gas industry who deliberately decided to 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 to, to destroy Pengasan in there by sacking literally all our executives there, a lot of our executives, and also going ahead uh, to lock our members out for a very long time. So uh, that is another issue that we are also pursuing in this regard. So as of today, Pengasan is on strike uh, nationwide. So, uh, for us, we have the interest of Nigerians at heart. That's what, that was why we have been discussing this subject for over six years. Uh, that is always why you don't see Pengasan rushing to declare strike uh, because we know the impact it's going to have on Nigerians. So we hereby call on the relevant government agencies to start engagement immediately so that in the next 24 hours, this subject will be, will be put to rest. We believe that they have the capacity to do it. We strongly believe that if they have the will, these issues could be resolved so that Nigerians will not be put into any form of hardship. And now for business news, here's Anne Wawodo.
Thank you, Lumide. Hello and welcome to Business News. Let's begin tonight with oil prices. After surging nearly 10% today, the prices are on track for its biggest daily gain in more than six months. And that's following the announcement of a potent COVID-19 vaccine developed by Pfizer and BioNTech. Global oil price benchmark Brent crude surged by 8.09% to $42.64 a barrel, while U.S. WTI crude surged by 9.05% to $40.52 a barrel. Both contracts also rose more than four in earlier sessions today. Meanwhile, Saudi Energy Minister Abdulaziz bin Salman says the OPEC Plus deal on oil output cuts could be adjusted to balance the market, but that is if there is consensus among members of the group, and this has increased the prospect of tighter supplies and higher oil prices. Meanwhile, Nigeria's total crude oil and gas export sale rose by 64.8% to $139.5 million in August 2020. And that's according to the latest data coming from the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation, the NNPC. In its monthly financial report and operations for the month under review, the NNPC says the country also exported $3.71 billion worth of crude oil and gas August last year to August 2020. And this is largely attributed to crude oil export, which of course contributed $80.27 million. And that's about 57.54% of the dollar transaction. The NNPC explains that a 45% improvement in performance was as a result of the 82% growth in surplus recorded by the Nigerian Petroleum Development Company as a result of sustained improvement in global markets fundamentals. And let's head to the stock market where a bolt out of the blues, Nigeria's equities market has started the second trading week in the month of November with a 3.96% rally. And that's its biggest gain in the new month following an upsurge, of course, in bargain hunting by investors for high valued stocks. BC Adebayo has the details for us. Thank you for joining us on the Stock Market Report. The bullish momentum in the local burst switched into a higher gear today as investors took in interest in MTN Nigeria, the banking and industrial stocks. The all share index jumped almost 4% to a new high, crossing the 32,000 psychological level, and that hasn't been seen this year at all. And the equity cap was also higher by over 640 billion naira. Now, gains from tier one lenders, Dangote Cement, Bois Cement, and Lafarge had significant significant impact on their respective counters as we saw the banking and industrial goods sectors jump 6.59% and 5.54% each. Now, the impact from tier one lenders was felt in all aspects of today's trading. Now, see this, the trio of Zenith, FBN Holdings and Access Bank were highest on the list of top trades. Well, it's green all round as the activity chart was not left out in today's gains as value and deals traded were higher compared to what we saw on Friday. And that's it on the Stock Market Reports. I am BC Adebayo. We we'll hope to see more of those green numbers. With that, we end business news tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Anne Mwawadu. Talk to you, Lumidi. Welcome back. On the foreign scene, U.S. President Donald Trump has sacked the country's Defense Secretary Mike Esper. The president announced his sack in a tweet, which reads, Mark Esper has been terminated. I would like to thank him for his service. Christopher Miller, the current head of the National Counterterrorism Center, will take the role of defense secretary. Ms. Esper had clashed with the president over the White House's use of military to quell public unrest during the protests over racial injustice earlier this year. It's a great day for science and humanity. So say Pfizer and BioNTech, developers of the first effective coronavirus vaccine, which they say can prevent more than 90% of people from getting COVID-19, according to preliminary analysis. The companies say they plan to apply for emergency approval to use the vaccine by the end of the month. Here's Simon Pusey with more on this and other international news on Around the World in 5. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. 
U.S. President-elect Joe Biden's team have announced he and his deputy Kamala Harris are to make tackling the coronavirus pandemic their top priority following his win over Donald Trump in the U.S. election. Announcing the first steps in his transition plan, his team said there would be more testing and Americans would be asked to wear masks. However, his win remains a projection as key states are still counting votes, while Mr. Trump's campaign announced he does not plan to concede. If you count the legal votes, I easily Mr. Trump win. is launching legal challenges the to the results votes, in several key states. He has made unsubstantiated claims of electoral fraud, but election officials say there is no evidence that the vote was rigged against him. The first coronavirus vaccine can prevent more than 90% of people from getting COVID-19. That's according to analysts by two leading companies. Pfizer and BioNTech described it as a great day for science and humanity. Their vaccine has been tested on 43,500 people in six countries, and no safety concerns have yet been raised. The companies plan to apply for emergency approval to use the vaccine by the end of the month. There are around a dozen vaccines in the final stages of testing around the world, but this is the first to show any results. The UK has said there is goodwill on both sides to progress towards a Brexit trade deal as a new round of talks with the European Union begin in London. The EU's chief negotiator, Michel Barnier, has met with British representatives in London. The UK left the European Union in January, but the sides are trying to clinch a deal that would govern nearly $1 trillion in annual trade. Mr Barnier said he was very happy to be back in London for talks and work continues. The talks have snagged over state aid rules and fisheries, a sector laden with symbolism for Brexit supporters in Britain. Police in the Georgian capital Tbilisi have fired water cannon at crowds protesting against the results of last week's parliamentary election. Thousands of people gathered outside the Central Election Commission to demand a new vote after accusing the governing party of rigging the poll. The Georgian Dream Party has denied the accusations of fraud, while international election observers said fundamental freedoms were respected but criticised aspects of the process. Georgian Dream, which was founded by billionaire Bidzina Ivanishvili and has been in power since 2012, secured over 48% of votes in the election held on October the 31st. The victory gives the party the right to form the country's next government. Azeris have celebrated on the streets of Baku after President Ilham Aliyev said his country's forces had taken Shusha, the second largest city in the Nagorno-Karabakh enclave. Shusha is of cultural and strategic importance to both sides. At least a thousand people have died in nearly six weeks of fighting in Nagorno-Karabakh, a mountainous enclave internationally recognized as part of Azerbaijan, but populated and controlled by ethnic Armenians. Armenia's defense ministry denied Mr Aliyev's statement. Thousands of Thai protesters have gathered to the Grand Palace in Bangkok to demand curbs to the king's powers and the removal of the government. Chanting slave to dictatorship, more than 10,000 protesters spilled onto the streets of the capital and were met by water cannon of the police. It's the latest in months of protests demanding curbs to the powers of the king, as well as the resignation of Prime Minister Prayuth Chanocha, a former general who seized power in a 2014 coup. Bolivia's former president Evo Morales has arrived near the border from where he plans to cross into the country from exile in Argentina. Mr. Morales said on Saturday that he would return after the inauguration of Luis R.K., who was sworn in on Sunday. The former president will be coming back to Bolivia nearly one year after resigning under pressure following allegations of fraud during the presidential election and escaping to exile in Argentina. And finally, Virgin Hyperloop, a futuristic transport concept involving pods inside vacuum tubes carrying passengers at high speeds, has trialled its first ever journey. In the trial in a desert in Nevada, two passengers, both company staff, traveled the length of a 500-meter test track in 15 seconds, reaching 174 kilometers an hour. <laughs> However, this is a fraction of Virgin's ambitions for travel speeds of more than 1,000 kilometers an hour. Virgin Hyperloop is not the only firm developing the concept, but nobody has carried passengers before. The concept is based on the world's fastest magnetic levitation trains, then made faster by speeding along inside vacuum tubes. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos.
Many thanks, Simon. The Confederation of African Football CAF has confirmed that no journalists or supporters will be allowed inside the Samuel Ogbemudia Stadium, Benin City, for the game between the Super Eagles of Nigeria and the Lone Stars of Sierra Leone. In the guidelines communicated to the Nigeria Football Federation, CAF instructed on the media operations that there will be no mixed zone, virtual press conference only if possible, and that only the TV channels with the rights will be allowed flash interviews. Also, only photographers of participating teams would be allowed at the match. The president of the Nigerian Football Federation, Amaju Pinnick, and his counterparts from Botswana and Sierra Leone have endorsed South African businessman Dr. Patrice Mutsepe as a candidate for the Confederation of African Football presidential election coming up in March 2021. Speaking to the media at Safa House, South Africa Football Association President Danny Odan explains why Dr. Mutsepe was chosen. A Nigeria professional football league side, Plateau United, will face Simba Sports Club of Tanzania in the preliminary round of the 2020-21 CAF Champions League. The Joss Bays team will host the first leg within the weekend of November the 27th to the 29th, with the return leg scheduled for the weekend of December the 4th to the 6th. Aimba International will play Burkina Faso's Rahimo FC in the preliminary round and also in the CAF Champions League. In the CAF Confederation Cup, two Nigerian sides, Kano Pillars and Rivers United, will take on clubs from Ghana and Equatorial Guinea in the preliminary rounds. And that's a wrap on Sports News. I'm Ivan.